Welcome everybody to uh, to our Soil Changing Farmers webinar series. Uh, I'm Jonathan Gooding, and I've got just a few ground rules before I turn it over to uh, to Jake in here. Um, so first of all, everybody or all of the attendees, all your uh, video is off and you're all muted. Um, but if you have questions, we'd love to hear your questions. Please use the Q&A panel. Uh, there's an icon with with two speech bubbles. That's the Q&A panel. So you can um, you can go in there and ask questions as we go at any time. Um, if you do want to send a message to the, the panelists that isn't a question, uh, you can use the chat feature to uh, to send that message. But if you got a question, please put it in the Q&A panel so that we can uh, keep all of those in the same place. Um, and then one more thing, if you're comfortable with it, uh, when you ask a question, if you can tell us where you're from, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear that as well. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jake and here Jake and Burns is uh, one of the sales representatives, um, actually leads the sales team here at Green Cover. Um, and Jake is going to introduce our guest. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm Happy to be here and just really grateful for our guest today. Um, filling in for Davis, who hosted our last webinar, is kind of our primary po or host for this webinar series. Um, but he's out right now at the hospital with his wife, hopefully having a baby or has already had the baby. So thoughts and prayers to Davis, um, and we'll have a, a good conversation here today. Um, Ronnie, I'll probably not do your intro complete justice, but I'll give it a shot with just a, a couple observations I've taken so far and then let you get into kind of sharing your your journey of soil health and regenerative ag and, and everything. Um, but yeah, it's been a pleasure just kind of getting to know. And we had a phone call yesterday and just chatting with them today too. Um, Ronnie has been taking over the, the family operation in 2009, I believe. And then in 2014, started with some uh, first, initially using some cover crops and getting more into the soil health principles and things like that. Um, and then 2019 was, I believe, a winner. Is that what you said of the Environmental Stewardship Award? Three um, one. Okay. Yep. And then, yeah, lots in between there with uh, some of the things that he'll share. One of the things, just briefly going over his was talk and seeing some of the things was just the the diversity um, that he'll touch on and. Kind of speaks to the diversity of of our different webinar series too. Last week we had the O'Crawleys from California, and um, now we'll go to to Ronnie and uh, Virginia. So um, we just kind of a good broad spectrum of of different people doing soil health principles and and just really well done agriculture. So um, yeah, I guess with that we'll we'll let Ronnie go and um, yeah let him share and think he's just a great example and. Um, yeah, leader in, in what soil health and regenerative ag is. So take it away, Ronnie. Thank you, Jake. And hello, my name is Ronnie Knuckles. Uh, glad to have an opportunity to share with you today and certainly like to thank Green Cover Seed for making this uh, an option. Uh, it's a little unusual talking to a computer screen, but we'll see what we can do with it. But I'd like to kind of start with a uh, history of the farm. That's not clicking. And uh, Overhome Farm is in Goochland County, Virginia. We are having a little technical difficulties right now getting, here we go. Uh, we're located in Goochland County. Uh, we're about 20 miles west of Richmond, Virginia, which is state capital. We're about a mile north of the James River. And as you can see from this photo, we are a very rolling topography. Uh, we're in mid-Atlantic, we're blessed with abundant water supply, and we have good shade cover for, 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 the, for the cattle. So it's uh, all in all a pretty good place to be if you want to raise cattle. My wife, Cheryl, and I have lived at Overhome for 48 years, and we manage a uh, cow-calf commercial, cow-calf operation uh, on the farm and have enjoyed doing that. Most of my adult life, I was in the construction business, excavation and grading. So I spent most of my time destroying soil structure. The last 14, I've had to do a 180 and learn how to protect it and enhance it. So uh, I've kind of seen it in both spectrums. 
Uh, we've lived there 48, but my family has been at the farm since 1876. And, and very fortunate to have some of the old photographs. I know this was taken prior to 1910. Uh, the farm, even though my family has been there since uh, 1876, was really started in the early 1700s. Two families preceded ours on the property. They raised tobacco, which was king in Virginia during that time, until the soil fertility just played out. And what they did in that time, when it got where it wasn't productive, they moved on to new location. The first couple of generations of my family there just made over home their home. Uh, there was no commercial farming going on. The land was given a long time to recover and nature will take care of itself and heal a lot of ills if you give it enough time. And that's what took place here. Uh, grandfather uh, took over the farm uh, when his parents passed away. Uh, he timbered the property around 1950, and he soon after that went into an excavation and grading company uh, that he managed, and as time permitted, they brought equipment back to the farm and cleared up some of the land that was timbered and established grass to kind of keep it stabilized. That was a slow process. It took several years in the process to complete it. My father, uh, when he, we moved to the farm, now this is my mother's family's farm, so my father gave up, left his family farm, and came to over home. And when he came, he brought a commercial cow-calf uh, herd to, to put on the property. To my knowledge, this was the first time a cattle herd had been on the farm, and he gradually built that over the years. Uh, over the next 40-plus years, that herd of 30 grew to about 90. He was able to graze about 300 acres at that time. And uh, you know, I'm gonna show some slides and I don't wanna be negative with this, but I don't just don't have the pictures to show the good times. But I wanna show a little bit of his management of how he happened. This field we will see again and again through this presentation. This is right beside our house. And this field was double cropped for at least 45 years uh, between corn silage and barley and clover for hay. Uh, he started out conventionally plowing, eventually went to chisel plowing so he could rip it deep. And then gradually towards the end, you know, they got to a drill and a disc combination to get these different uh, crops planted. Uh, original, uh, Infrastructure, the perimeter fencing was bob wire on cedar post and trees, uh, was put in in the 60s. So you can imagine what this starts to look like come 2005 and in moving forward, we had a lot of uh, cattle leave the reservation during that time. It wasn't unusual to get a call anytime, day or night and have a neighbor say, hey, you got cattle in my garden. So really was getting to be a point that something major needed to happen. Uh, just to kind of highlight grazing, and this was a very open grazing system. There were three large pastures during this time, and when things got dry, or in the winter time, the gates would be open and cattle could be anywhere over 300 acres. Uh, because of the size of the calves, we're a fall calving uh, herd, we always have been. Uh, I'm assuming this is late October, early November. So you can see not a lot to choose from as far as forage there. The, the pond behind the cow, that was a water source. They had free access to that and they pretty much destroyed the shoreline all the way around that. This shot, uh, same field that he was harvesting corn in earlier. Uh, so I know this is uh, before the first week in September because it was always cut in time for uh, dove season. He was an avid hunter, loved to shoot doves. So I can time this picture based on that. Uh, two things, it's a good corn crop. So I know we've had some pretty good rain that season. Uh, the fence kind of shows the infrastructure that was available. And then in this lower right corner, you look at what a pasture is in early September and you kind of wonder why, you know, what caused this pasture to be that weak. 
this uh, last shot it shows that same field, and I really showed it to show you the weak area that you still see a lot of dirt through. The, the difference between that pasture from side to side, and I know this was a dry fall because I can tell by the other pastures and the way the yard looked at the time. But we'll, like I say, this thing's gonna keep coming back to haunt us throughout this presentation. We'll kind of park it here a little bit, and I, I certainly didn't generate this list all at once. It developed over time as I got into things, and uh, I'd help my brother and I'd helped their father with the cattle for probably close to 40 years. He passed away suddenly at the end of 2008, um, and it took his passing for me to realize I knew nothing about managing cattle or managing pastures. Uh, I'd been a helper. And when you're a helper, it's very easy to find problems, not so easy to find solutions. So that first year was very stressful and for me and the cattle. And I realized at that point, if I was gonna to continue to raise cattle, I had to get things in my terms that I could deal with. And one of the first steps was I had to decide what were my goals? What do I wanna achieve with this operation? And two main points came up. One, I wanted the farm to look good. I wanted it to be a kind of place when you drove in, you could appreciate that it was maintained. Uh, it was a nice piece of property and it needed to be shown that way. And the second, I needed to manage the cattle instead of having them manage me. So to come up with answers, I knew I didn't have them. I started reaching out to different farm organizations and talking to staff at these different organizations and visiting other farms that looked like had a better handle on what they were doing than where I was. Uh, it is a lot of great resources out there for producers. And Virginia, I know we're very blessed here and I assume you are in your neighborhood too, but I think too often we overlook these resources and just try to wing it on our own and you don't really have to do that. It didn't take long to realize that the foundation for whatever you want to do starts with soil health. And these main categories that are listed below, we'll kind of look at some examples of how I've used those. And, you know, my case is not a pure soil health lesson. It's adapted to a, producing a cattle herd and a productive cattle herd. So I've had to alter and modify a few of these, but for the most part, I've seen the advantages of honoring these and trying to include them in my plans. My first step at Overhome was in infrastructure. I had next to none. Uh, so I realized before I could start improving soil quality, I had to have the, the, the situation that I could create that. And that meant a lot of new fencing and water sources. Started with Monacan Soil and Water District, which is our uh, district for Goochland and Powhatan County. Uh, Keith Burgess, our uh, director there, 25 plus years experience and was a really big asset in coming up with how to, how to set this up. Uh, we did a stream exclusion practice to start off with, and that means we uh, put a 35 foot buffer around all the creeks, the ponds, and any main drainage ways. Cattle no longer have access to freestanding water. I used a high tensile electric, which I liked a lot, never been exposed to it, but really a nice product to work with. Uh, they also recommended to promote rotational grazing to improve the quality of my stand that we do division fencing. I had none of that. This whole screen would have been one pasture uh, before this project, now the cattle viewed me not as an enemy, but as a friend because I opened the gate to give them a clean pasture. Uh, big impact on the mentality of the herd and being able to manage and handle them in a different way. All right, we've taken the water source away, so we've got to replace it. We used existing pond. We pump water to these holding tanks, which gave us about 4,500 gallons of water at any one time. From this high location, we can gravity feed to the water tanks. Uh, these tanks really work great in mid-Atlantic. They don't freeze during the winter and they keep the water cool in the summer. Uh, the blue balls are an indicator you have water pressure. 
So you don't have to physically inspect one to make sure they're working. If you see blue, you've got water. Uh, moving and rotating cattle, I think it helps uh, gentling them. If they're working with them on a daily or weekly basis, they get familiar with them. But my handling facility for vaccines and whatever sorting we do is at the other end of the farm. This lane creates a very easy way for me to move cattle by myself and you just see how calm and relaxed they are in transit. Uh, the slide, I'm really trying to show a number of things. Uh, diversity is one of those key components of soil health, but I apply that in a lot of different directions. I think size of pastures is key to a cattle operation. You don't, one size doesn't fit all. And sometimes you want to sort and put a smaller group together for one reason or another. Uh, sometimes you want a larger group. But this, past, this picture also shows diversity of vegetation and different pastures. That different, you need to feed cattle 365 days a year. If your whole farm looks the same at any one time, then sometimes the year you're going to have more than you need. Other times you're not going to have enough. So I basically have tried to come up with a scheme that I have some pastures that are coming on. I want some that are there ready to graze and I've got some that are kind of coming off. So that rotation continues, but you try to fill that gap to get as close as you can to year round grazing. Uh, this has nothing to do with soil health, but it's also uh, it has a lot to do with the Chesapeake Bay and why this practice is available and why the state is willing to pay 75% of installed cost to put the fences up and provide a new water source. But uh, just banks have healed up almost immediately and you see how clear the water is. This shot wouldn't be possible if the cattle were in the creeks. And this is memories that are being built and will last a lifetime and only possible because the cattle no longer control the, the landscape. All right, diversity again, and I, I title this diversity among your pastures, but I think it also could mean diversity within your pastures. Uh, we had a joint field day in 2015, Virginia Forge Grassland Council, NRCS, Virginia Cooperative Extension, and Monacan joint ventured this, and it was, uh, really the beginning uh, of my uh, travel through the annuals for grazing. Uh, this particular field that we've been looking at a lot, we split that into zones. We went to different seed providers and we asked them to provide us with a mix of their recommendation. We didn't tell them what to give us, but the criteria was it needed to provide grazing for late fall, early spring. And that same mix had to come back in the springtime for good spring grazing. So you can kind of look through this of the different uh, mixes that, but a lot of these things I'd never heard of. I just didn't have the experience in it. And it was a great learning curve for me to see these different mixes come out of the ground. Uh, No-till drill, great tool. It's got a lot of advantages, but you need to know how to set it. And here, J.B. Daniels with NRCS is looking at the depth to make sure the seed is going in properly. Uh, Reba in the middle is just checking to see what J.B. is looking for. And then I'm watching the whole show there to try to learn a few things. Here we are back again, and J.B. is looking at what's coming up. He's kind of giving me a, a lesson on what the different things look like. And that was probably the biggest advantage of this field day was so much one-on-one -on -one time with JB and some of the others to, to really learn what I'm trying to do and get that on firsthand knowledge. This is what the five different zones look like by mid-November of that year. And you see the diversity of the mixes and how they looked at that point. Uh, these, I'm not a numbers guy. I, I look at appearances. I wish I was more of a number guy. But JB did a follow-up behind this, uh, this field day, and he provided these charts. And this one is showing the, uh, the fall uh, forage and the quantity and quality of the different strips. This one is showing the springtime mix, same, same values. 
and also the length of time that the grazing provided, uh, which was uh, important, I think. This uh, graph shows the balance between the fall grazing and spring grazing. And all of these are depending on rain and weather. Uh, each year is going to be different. But this is what it looked like in 2015. Uh, just a shot of my pasture. And this is kind of the mix that I have kind of settled into after the demonstration. And I use this mix uh, for two reasons. I use it in transition if I'm taking an existing pasture and I want to convert it to a permanent pasture with a different seed base. I will use this mix in the process to improve the soils. So I don't have that look you saw in that field by the house with some green, some brown. And I actually used this mix for seven years until that brown disappeared and that field became consistent top to bottom. And then I knew it was time to convert to permanent vegetation. Uh, this is a November shot of that uh, field day, and you look at the turnip and the tillage radish. Uh, first time through with these, it was just amazing. Uh, you see the, the bulbs, and really what that radish is doing, it's sending down feeder roots, maybe as low as three feet in a season. Those feeder roots reach nutrients and trace minerals that the grasses can't get to because the roots don't go deep enough. It brings it to the bulb where it stores it uh, until it dissolves over the winter. And then springtime, those nutrients are there right on the surface for the grasses. So big advantage. Also, there's a lot to break up compaction on hard areas. Springtime grazing, same mix. In the winter mix, I grazed it down almost to dirt. Uh, they kept telling me, don't worry, it'll come back in the spring. And I was pretty nervous until I saw kind of first of April, and I did see it really bounce back and, and put the forage on the ground. Uh, this shot, you know, when I said my two objectives, one, I wanted the farm to look good. I wanted a productive cattle operation. This kind of goes to that first goal. It adds color to your landscape, kind of brightens the farm up, and it's great nutritional value and all of this stuff, but it just does a lot to make the place look better. Same shot here showing the vetch, a few other things, uh, cattle grazing that mix. This year was a great clover vetch year in this mix. Some other years you may not see as much, but each year is different, but the whole basic program, pretty strong. Uh, kind of the permanent shot, last time we we're gonna see this field, uh, but this is a stand of weeds. I planted novel fescue in early September. We didn't get rain for the month of September. So the weeds came up. I knew the seed was there, so I just kept the weeds under control. Eventually, the novel took over, but now this feed, field is very productive as a permanent cool season grass. The second mix I use uh, is similar to the first, but I don't require grazing early winter. These pastures, I, I, I have my calving season in these, so it's grazed intensively in August, September, October. End of October, I drill it with a mix that does not include the spring oats or the uh, tillage radish because they don't go through the winter, but pretty much everything else in that first mix is. And it gives me grazing. I'm typically grazing by the third week in March, which can be up to 30 days sooner than normal cool season grasses are really productive. Um, it's just a great, I can get two or three rotations through it. They're not midgets, they're full grown cattle that you see in the background. Uh, sometimes, and I do about 40 acres or a third of my farm in this mix. Uh, sometimes I can't get to it fast enough before it gets mature. So, but it makes great hay if you can't get to it to graze it. Uh, the byproduct of this mix is these pastures that I'm drilling it in really were a mixed bag. They were, you know, some cool season, some warm season. But by competing with the native cool season, I have converted them to strictly warm season native grasses. So I've got Bermuda grass, I've got crab grass, and I've got Johnson grass. So really matches up for where I want my cattle to be at that time of year. Pearl millet, I use that in a summer rotation. And uh, really, if you're having a drought, 
that millet's still going to produce and it's just a safety valve. If I don't need it for grazing, I will put it up in hay. So versatile crop. Uh, novel fescue, and I didn't have any completely clean stands of anything when I started. And so I've been really impressed with the novel and the quality of it. Because of my spring mix I'm using, I don't have to graze the novel in spring. I typically can stockpile that if I need it in the summer. Or if I don't, I'll cut it for hay and bale it and let it come back in the fall. Permanent pasture, warm season, uh, switchgrass, a little slower to get started, but that's another crop that's really good for the summer. It doesn't need a lot of water. They recommend you don't fertilize it, but this was, was naturally here when the settlers came through in the 1700s. It's, it's made for our soil. It's just slow to get it started, but once you get it there, it's uh, easy to keep. And that pretty well sums it up. I know I went a little bit long with that, but hopefully it'll maybe answer, or maybe strike a few things that you see that maybe will work for you. I know, you know, different parts of the country, you've got different weather conditions and a lot of this isn't possible, but maybe still it'll trigger a thought that will give you something to, to work with. All right, Jake, and I'll turn it back to you. Sounds good. Thanks, Ronnie. That was, that was excellent. We can, uh, well, I guess I have a couple of questions for you, and then there's already some Q&As coming through the chat and everything, so we'll get to those here in a few minutes as well. Um, my first question I had for you, <clears throat> maybe a two-part question, going back to one of your slides with the, the challenges, or you had an eight or so bullet point list of the, um, the challenges there. One, is there one that was like surprising of... I didn't anticipate that being such an issue as it was. And then second, was there one that's still challenged? What's the most challenging now even using some of these soil health principles, if that makes sense? Oh, I was hoping this was multiple choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at my list. But, you know, I think my biggest surprise uh, was that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I really was surprised. All of them... I didn't see any of them in the beginning other than I lacked infrastructure. Uh, I think that you know, the diversity was not something I considered up front, and I certainly saw it as I worked through the process, uh, but it kind of caught me flat-footed on that one. No, that makes sense. Yeah. What about now? Like, what's, what's maybe a challenge that you're still dealing with? You know, I think what the issue of diversity and... Mm. I know in the truest sense of the word, each one of the pastures would be a pasture that would flourish in cool season, and then you'd flip a switch and it would do it again in the warm season, and that doesn't happen in nature. Most of my pastures was a blend, and it was some of cool season and some of warm season, but at any one season, you were only 50% productive. Mm -hmm. So you've got a 10 acre pasture, but in effect, you've got a five acre pasture. It's taking up 10 acres of ground to do it. So, you know, it's kind of like water, you know, hot water, you make tea or make coffee, cool water. It's good to drink by itself. You mix the two, you wash your hands in it. It's, it's not really usable. Yeah. And so I've, I've chosen to modify that diversity in that I want my pastures to be diverse. Mm -hmm but I wanted to be consistent within the pastures. Now, that spring mix that I talked about, I think is the closest I can come to that because that pasture, say it's a five acre pasture, it's extremely productive once I drill that mix in, I've got late March, April, May into June, I can rotate through that pasture three times, typically. And then I have June and July that it just kind of is, is in transition. And then the summer grasses come on in July, August, September. And they'll be okay until we get frost, which in our area is typically in November. Mm -hmm. So really, I've and then I turn them green again almost immediately. Mm -hmm. So they look good for December, January, February. So to me, that's the best of both worlds. Uh, I'm getting 10 acres of grazing out of five acres of land. It is some cost, but I think it's a cost worth doing. Uh, I like that. 
Now, looking down the road, is that a permanent solution? I don't know. But for what I see ahead of me now, I don't see a better alternative. Yeah. Hmm. That's really good. One thing I liked your your slide of the river, um, and then you shared the the kids there. Yeah. Um, and just thinking about like water quality, I mean that is something significant in your area, your area especially with the rivers yeah. and everything. Right. Here in corn country, Nebraska, and then if you go into you know just areas with the Mississippi River, I mean yeah. water quality is such a is such a big thing, an important yeah. topic. So um, that's cool to see how. I mean, I think it is kind of a soil health issue too at times so um, glad that you shared a little bit on that but you know jake you know follow up on that i'm, I'm also a director at monica soul and water i didn't become a director until actually i'd seen how they worked mm -hmm. and the benefit they provide and it's typically non-government there's no there's almost no red tape involved in what they do they just get on the ground and get it done sure. so i agreed to run for a director spot but when we go to, other, and I felt the same way when again, that, you know, I don't want to give up a 35 foot buffer of my creeks. And, you know, this is some of your most lush grazing you have, and you're keeping the cattle out. But what I very soon realized is I'm not giving up anything. I'm just transitioning that to a higher use. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a perimeter trail around the farm, and I've got a playground down at the creek that I didn't show. But we're using that a lot more importantly than what the cattle used it for. And so with the rotational grazing, I increased my grazing potential almost the first year of not being able to rotate and then rotate and rest. And now I've got a 175 acre farm. We reduced it to 125 acres. Mm -hmm. I would say year two, I had more grazing than I did with 175. And I've only seen that grow as the years progressed. So I think it's just putting land to a higher use. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously a lot of that has to do with the rotation and everything. Yes. Uh, can you give a little bit of either practical advice or tips on um, just strategies on rotating? Like how long are you leaving them on there? Are you grazing it down there to the ground? I assume obviously you're not, but, you know, talk about what you're leaving and what you're taking and what's regrowing and, and things like that. You know, that depends on what's in the pasture. And there are times when I do this uh, cool this mix that I'm putting in for the spring grazing, I do graze that. Bermuda grass, you can graze that to the ground. It, it stores all its energy in the root system. And that's a very tough, durable grass that cattle don't tear up really bad in the wintertime. But your fescue that's going to store in the leaf, you want to take half and leave half, maybe when you're going through stockpiled in the wintertime, maybe you graze a little bit closer mm -hmm. to the plants dormant anyway. Um, the switchgrass, you want to leave about 12 inches. You don't want to get closer than 12. So you've got to learn your species and learn what they can tolerate and how that plant operates. You know, where is storage in that plant? And that kind of controls it. But yeah, I'm, I'm currently working on a grazing plan with NRCS and and they're going to help me learn a little bit more as to better manage. Uh, a lot depends on what you've got coming and what's behind you. And, you know, like I say, I, I started thinking I'm not going to cut hay on this farm anymore. My father did it for years and he cut late June and you, know, you get a dry June, July. That's why you don't have any grazing come August and September. Mm -hmm. uh, but with this, forage and rotation and rest, I probably cut maybe close to half of my pastures last year for hay because I get, couldn't get to it to graze them. Now, my stocking rate's down a little bit. I've done that on purpose to give me a chance to renovate pastures, but I'm at a point because of what I saw last year, I'm ready to up the herd a little bit, maybe add another 10 to 15 animals uh, to the herd this year through heifers that I've developed. And But I think you've got to find that right balance between stocking rate and how much are you willing to feed hay in the dry times. It's a, it's a balancing act. It's not always easy to come up with the right answer. Mm -hmm. No, that's really good. Knowing your species is excellent yeah. advice. And yeah, picked up some things there. Last question I'll ask, and then we can jump into some of the Q&A. Um, 
when you were talking about, let's see, what was I going to ask? Um, oh, yeah. One of the comments here, not in the Q&A, but just uh, speaking to like the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, you had some pictures of you and JB in the field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just, I'm sure what a impact that must have made. My question, I guess, is how would you uh, maybe advise a young producer or somebody who's just kind of starting out that doesn't necessarily have access or doesn't think they have access to, a, you know, a wealth of knowledge or, you know, kind of a, a speaker of wisdom, somebody to come out and help them along the way? What would you give their advice? I would say change that philosophy because I think you've got that. It's a case yeah. of making that first contact. And, you know, Virginia Forage and Grassland Council is a really strong agency in Virginia. They put on pasture walks and they do grazing seminars and they do fencing schools. And before I had the one-on-one, -on -one, I started going to those. And, you know, I was one of 150 in a crowd, but you learn the basics, you learn who the key players are, and you just keep making phone calls and I know different areas are going to be more, resp uh, or more responsive than others, but they're out there. But what I also found, I learned as much from other farm people that were already doing grazing that none of the stuff I'm doing is original to me. It's all been done before me and done better. But I've been able to learn from other producers probably as much as I have from the professionals. And after 35 years in construction, where if you get an advantage, you keep it a secret. You don't share it with your competitor, but I didn't find that in the grazing community. Everybody's willing to, they open their farm up, you come in, they see, you see the good stuff and the bad, and you find things that you wanna try, and sometimes you see things, nope, I'm not going there. So I think there's a wealth of information that's readily available. You just gotta knock on enough doors to, to get started. And I think the other key lesson that I learned through this 12 year adventure uh, is the importance of soils in the beginning. And that was not on my radar when I started. Mm -hmm. but I very soon learned how important that was. It's the foundation that everything else builds on. Mm -hmm. And it's no use planting a bunch of pastures until your soil's right. Uh, the other thing was weed suppression. And I had a tremendous weed problem that I got involved late in the game, but you don't want to start fertilization if you're just fertilizing weeds. So hmm. whether you can live with chemical control or you have to try to find something else, that needs to be step one, eliminate the competition. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. And what you were speaking to with just kind of, you know, knocking on doors and starting the conversation, yeah. that speaks a lot to, there's a, a short book called The Proximity Principle. Um, pretty easy read there, but it just talks about, you know, getting yourself in the room of, you know, what your, your big goals are, just kind of starting with, um, you know, a, a small seat at the table, even if it's just standing in the doorway type of thing, and then being willing to stay afterwards and have some conversation and kind of have that courage too. So, yeah, I, I think that works well. And, you know, now, of course, I'm not an internet person. I'm trying to dig into it a little bit, but there's so much stuff on YouTube. You can take a trip without leaving the farm. <laughs> you can yeah, see yeah all absolutely. Stuff firsthand. And it's just a wealth of information on that uh, on YouTube and other sources. And uh, yeah, it's just so much out there, but you've got to know what you're looking for mm -hmm. to know that you found it when you see it. That's right. Oh, that's really good. Thanks, Ronnie. Let's go to a couple of Q&A questions. And we were just talking about weed suppression. Uh, so there's one question here from Karen in North Carolina. Um, to acquire diversity in pastures, iron weed is becoming more dominant. Do you recommend or do I have bush hog to restrict the iron weed from becoming dominant? Or what are your thoughts there? And I'm not an expert on this. I'm I'm learning. I started weed suppression kind of late. My first thought was, yeah, I'm a bush hog. My first mm -hmm. year that I took over and I got a 7220 John Deere that stands about eight feet tall. I had weeds over the top of the cab. And so I knocked it down, but it's like putting a Band-Aid on a cut. Now, this is my take. This is not professional, mm -hmm. but to... To fix the problem, you've got to deal with the root of the plant that's growing. And that's through great, and I'm not going to go brand specific, but Graze on Next is what I've used. Uh, Duracore is another product uh, that's going to hit broadleaf, not hit your grasses. It's select. You don't want to go in with Roundup and do a total burn down. 
unless mm. you're planning on renovating the pasture. Mm. Uh, but there are select chemicals out there. Um, Long-term effects, I can't answer that, but it's a risk I was willing to take on my place. Yeah, no, that's good. There's definitely a lot to consider there. And, you know, to, to add to the five principles of the soil health you shared, I mean, the sixth one that's often talks about is the context and just knowing kind of what fits your situation might not always be the answer for another situation. Oh. And I admire people that do it organically. I just haven't figured out how to pull that trigger. I know they're cringing when I talk about graze on and Duracore, but it's uh, it's just different tools in your box. You've got to decide which ones you want to use. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go to this one. I think if I'm understanding right, let's see, after the, um, oh, for making the cover crop or the mix, maybe it's meaning like as you're drilling or planting it, um, do you, you till or are you drilling a no-till drill? And I guess maybe to get at some of the question is, you know, is it difficult to plant some annual cover crops into an already existing, you know, pasture and different things like that? I don't know if I'm missing a little bit of the question, but I'd be curious too with like planting rates and yeah. you know, doing a full rate versus going down if something's already there. Well, I'll have to say I have relied on y'all's uh, calculator chart that y'all have on your website. A great tool for a beginner to give you advice as to how much rate of each one to put in a mix. Mm -hmm. uh, I am using a no-till drill and you calculate, it's all mixed in together. So I'm emptying a 50 pound bag into a hopper on a no-till drill instead of putting a sheet of plastic down and taking five different components and trying to mix it at home. Typically, the depth, what I've tried to do is kind of go mid-range. It's more likely you're going to do have problems if you go too deep. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, clover, typically, you want just under the surface. I'm drilling three-quarter to half inch. But I think the clover is following the channel that the uh, millet or something else has created. But I seem to get a good mix uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with the diversity of the mix and how it's scattered throughout the field. I don't see isolated spots as all one, 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 the other, but no-till is a great tool if you've got access to it. It restricts the amount of seeds you need uh, because you can put it exactly where you need it. Yeah, that's really good. And the planting depth, I mean, that's another advantage of diversity. It's not just after it's in the soil and growing with a different you know, root types and stuff, but yeah, coming up, I mean, you wouldn't want to plant just clover by itself at, you know, an inch deep or anything, yeah. um, but with the peas or grasses or other species in there, uh, it really does come up really nice. Some of those smaller seeded species yeah. when it's planted with the larger species. Yeah. So that's really good. Um, let's go to this one from Jonathan in Mississippi. Uh, he says, I'm a hair sheep producer looking to possibly planting a cool season cover crop in a worn out sweet potato ground to give it a five to seven year rest period. Would you just let the native seed bank uh, form a warm season pasture or would you seed a warm season grazing cover? You know, I'm, I'm out of my league talking about Mississippi, I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't know what options they have. Mm -hmm. uh, but if he's trying to get a cool season into that, I don't know. Do you how well does cool season, what I think of cool season in mid-Atlantic, how does that translate to Mississippi? Uh, mm -hmm. They're not going to have the fescues, I don't think. Maybe so, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, natural seed, a lot, of, a lot of people to the party, I don't think you want invited. So I think you want to control it. If it's pretty much weed-free now, keep it weed-free and come up with a recommendation from your local people that know what they're talking about instead of me from Virginia to make a recommendation <laughs> yeah. as to what to plant. But I would definitely control that narrative and not let nature do what it wants to do. Yeah, I like that. And, you know, there's, I think Jonathan just mentioned on the um, chat here, the guy who asked the question, but yeah, they have a lot of ryegrass, annual ryegrass and things like yeah. that. Mississippi yeah. And um, yeah. Putting some in there, whether you decide that's annuals or some other perennials, um, yeah, would be yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, here's another question: Have you seen your dollars increase after your soil health journey? 
I guess a little bit on the economics is it, it is. And I, 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 was, <laughs> I was scared about that problem. Uh, I've been in build up mode the whole time I've been in charge of the catalog. You saw what I started with. You see where I'm at. Uh, it's not a, it's not my main source of income, and that can be a curse sometimes because because it's not your main income. I mean, I'm still going to eat whether my cattle produce or not. Um, mm -hmm that you tend to take it lightly and it shouldn't be it's an important factor and I, i've kind of turned that stone corner nail where i am starting to look at the finances and instead of just doing things to make the farm better i want to continue that train but i also want to on joint track how can i make it more productive what can we do to generate more income mm. while we're going down that track so yeah, I definitely see improvement uh, is across the board. Uh, I'm feeding much less hay than I was before. Uh, early on, I had to supplement hay with uh, pellets from a you know, feed producer, 14, 16% to get enough energy. Body conditions were not good. Conception rates were lower. You know, air conception rates in the mid nineties now on calving Calving bottle, the cow's body score is not dipping below, it's typically mm -hmm. below a six. Uh, pastures are looking better. Uh, it's the whole thing. When I take steers to market, they're grading out top at the sale. So yeah, it, it all adds up. I can't put a number to it, but it's there. And I'm very comfortable the way it's progressing. I just think there's still room to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of a follow-up question to that I didn't read that the first time, but Jody also asked kind of whether by having to spend less on feed and kind of less inputs, um, so that could be part of more of the yeah. economic gains and then um, hopefully some more production as well. But yeah, less inputs is a huge thing for cattle. It is a huge thing for road crop farmers as well, going more towards the, you know. Yeah. Okay. We had one question here um, talking about weeds in the pasture and, and not wanting to have those come up, but don't the cattle eat the weeds? If they have a choice, typically no. When you finish grazing a pasture that has good grass in it and has weeds, you take them out, typically what's left are the weeds. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I know there's some weeds that are good in protein and energy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I want to keep control and weeds tend to take over. They're pulling nutrients and moisture away from the desired plant. Mm -hmm. and it, it, that's a personal question that each person got to answer for themselves. For me, I want a clean pasture and that goes back to the, the appearance of it. I want it to look good and I want to keep them where they are productive. I want to keep the species of grass that I have to continue, and if it has competition, you're not doing that. You're losing ground. And every day to Sunday, weeds are going to compete something you plan. That's just the way it is. They can survive in drier conditions. You know, some advantages, uh, weeds will pull up, their roots go deep, and they'll, like the radishes and the turnips and the canola. And sometimes they'll bring stuff to the surface, but at the same time, they're probably taking away more than they're adding to the equation. So for me, I'm going to try to keep money control. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it goes back to what you said earlier with knowing your species, even yeah. knowing your weed species. Exactly. Some are probably more nutritious than others. Some are going to be more invasive and harder to control than others. Yeah. Um, so some may not be a huge problem. And, you know, what they say about weeds is you know, nature's band-aid or it's telling a story. Yeah. So it's definitely something to to take mind of. And some might be more you know, yeah. what you want to control and some you're okay with a little bit more. But they're called weeds for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. So, no, that's good. Um, I'm curious how, um, maybe from, I guess, whatever time frame you want to structure this question in, but from 2016 or 2019 to now, kind of how has your, maybe what were some of your initial soil health goals? And then how has that kind of changed over time? Okay. That gives me a good opportunity to bring up fertilization. We haven't talked about that at all. Uh, we use biosolids and I don't know how, how many people that are listening have that opportunity. And that's a hot and cold to topic in itself. You either love them or you hate them. Uh, we've used them for a number of years. We do the half rate, but before they can apply those, they have to do a nutrient management plan. 
that's reviewed by DCR and they cannot apply more than my soils can take up. So they're not just dumping it on the ground. It's stuff is checked for heavy metals and contaminants at the plant before it leaves. They have it with lime, without. So if your pH needs adjustment, it's a free commodity. Uh, they spread it for you. You just have to give them the permission to do it. Uh, that's helped a lot. Um, I have not, because they've been doing it, I have not been retesting. And I, I, this year, I think I'm going to test behind them or in front of them and see how the tests match up and just for my own benefit. But just from the production that pastures are generating and the fact that the pastures are becoming more consistent uh, in how it looks from one side of the pasture to the other. Uh, I don't have the numbers to back it up, but we've made pretty strong progress in improving that. And I still have maybe 30 acres that I want to convert to a permanent stand mm -hmm. from these warm water pastures that are split 50 50. Uh, I still have some more to convert, but you know, we'll do them one at a time. And like I say, it may take two or three years to get one of those to where I see the, the signals that it's ready to go permanent and to be able to thrive once it gets there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really good. I don't know. A question I've had a lot in the past um, is just, you know, grazing versus you mentioned potential of, of a hay crop. Um, and a lot of the species can do both. Um, and then I'd be a not a very good sales rep if I didn't mention and reiterate what you said about the smart mix calculator. So in there can help kind of give some species recommendations on if you're grazing it or if you're looking to graze, but possibly hay it, that might be some slightly different species or similar species, but different variety of millet or sorghum or, you know, warm or cool season cereal or something like that. So yeah. I'll give you another plug. Uh, multiple times when I've called into place to order, I've been told I'm, um, ordering too much seed per acre. <laughs> That's not the role y'all should be playing, but it's one I certainly uh, respect you for. Mm -hmm. And I've compromised. I have cut back as prices have gone up and I'm cost conscious what I'm spending. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I've come off my rates a little bit, and uh, but I like what I'm seeing. And I guess I'm scared to go whole turkey and do the whole thing and one reduction, but yeah, I, I, there are different things you can do to adjust that up and down. Mm -hmm. but I, I've been very pleased with the mixes and, you know, just the fact that I am able to have surplus grazing, you know, in different parts of the year, not just springtime, like it would be if you all cool season, mm -hmm. uh, but the millet, you know, that's a kind of a wild card. I can do either one. And it makes great hay. And same thing with spring mix. I don't want it to go over mature to where it's lost its value of grazing. So you try to maximize the production of that pasture, either through grazing or through, through hay. Now, when you do it for grazing, you're getting a better distribution of the manure going back on the soil. Yeah. Um, but you, we unroll hay when we feed and we try to put it back for the most part, in the same pastures it came from. So that's uh, another way to kind of comp uh, compensate for that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, to be a little, like, vulnerable, I guess. I mean, you could talk to all the experts in soil health and cover crops specifically, and you'd get a lot of different perspectives on planting rates. And, I mean, there's just so many variables of yeah. what your goals are. You might want to have a higher rate for grazing yeah. if we're just ground cover, maybe backing off. Yeah. higher rainfall environment you might want to go higher but at the same time if it's a drier year or for certain species it could go less i mean it's kind of a um not a shot in the dark but there's just a lot of different variables at play when you're thinking about you know how many pounds per acre or how, what full seeding rate should i do so um and i would veer a lot towards your own personal experience too you know trying it maybe a couple of different plots or just kind of what you've done year to year so yeah that's good um let's see one of the last questions I had on my list, um, and we mentioned it a little bit even before we went live, is uh, just kind of your perspective on where you're at, kind of on the eastern part of the country to to west with a lot larger uh, just farmland, I guess. But overall, um, do you feel optimistic about the future of, of ag and future of farming? 
uh, Air Farm is located, like say, 20 minutes from Richmond. Before long, that's going to be 10 minutes to Richmond. The suburbs are growing. Mm -hmm. You're pretty much an island where we are. It's development, large lot subdivisions around us. Uh, we're pretty much surrounded. I have placed Air Farm in a conservation easement, which means it will never be divided. Hmm. Uh, it doesn't have to always be farmed, actually farmed, but it can never be a subdivision. That farm has existed for 300 years. Uh, I don't think I have the authority to take it out of agriculture and put it into cash, which would mean if we've developed it. Yeah. And the little boys you saw in the creek, they're grandsons that are growing up on the farm now. So I want to at least give them an opportunity to do what I was able to do. So I am. And I recently took a road trip that took me from Virginia, uh, weaving through Kentucky and Illinois and Indiana and Minnesota, Iowa. I kind of skipped. Well, we did go through it, but I left it in my narrative. South Dakota, um, Montana, down through Utah, Wyoming, uh, Colorado, Indiana, uh, Idaho, the other I state, and then back southern leg through a little bit of New Mexico. But long story short, uh, where I'm seeing a lot of farmland being swallowed up by development where we are, mm -hmm. which is a major concern, uh, farming is still king in most of this country. And yeah. It really does encourage me to think, hey, it's a future for farming. You just may have to relocate to stay in it. Mm. But, uh, yeah, it's just a lot of diversity in the country that I'd never seen firsthand. But I, I am very encouraged. And the development that we're making, the effort that states and the federal government are putting to us helping farmers. Uh, not only financial incentives to try different things and put stuff in practice, but the technical advice. Uh, yeah, I think it is a great future ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope so, because we got a lot of people to feed. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good answer. I think I would agree. And it, it kind of ties back to our uh, green cover, our purpose statement. And I don't know if everybody knows, because we just slightly tweaked it not too long ago, where it's uh, to help people regenerate, but also to steward and share God's creation for future generations. So yeah, the boys in the creek, I mean, that's um, relatable to a lot of different people and um, just kind of keeping that on and not just sustainable, but just yeah. making that even better for uh, generations to come. So I had great. a soil scientist come to the farm 2014 and we were looking at a pasture that had a lot of little ups and downs. And, and I said, you know, when did this erode that much mm. create this landscape? And I said, I know it was timbered in the 50s. He looked at me. He said, you know, that didn't happen in the 50s. That happened probably 150 years prior to that. And he <laughs> says, you know, they did no environmental. They came into this area. Topsoil would have been two feet deep. Now, can you imagine what you could grow? And I don't know whether it would hold up tractors if topsoil that deep. But what was possible, and now on Air Farm, and I think we're pretty well blessed with topsoil. We've six to eight inches in most places that's distinguishable as topsoil. Yeah. But how much can I build that over my lifetime? You know, can I get it back to 10 inches maybe before I pass it off? Mm -hmm. But I think that's the attitude we all need to take is not what I can get out of this, but what can I put back in it for the next generation? How can I make it easier for them than I saw? So that's kind of where I'm trying to go at this point. I love it. That's really great. Good, good wisdom there for sure. Ronnie, any, uh, any last thoughts or anything you want to uh, plug before we kind of end here? No, I probably plugged enough. <laughs> well, appreciate your, yeah, again, your wisdom and insight and perspective. That was very valuable for me personally, and hopefully everybody else watching. So, so thanks again for joining. Okay.